Well, good morning. Welcome to the Atlantic Council. I'm Eric Batberg. I direct the Euro program at the Carnegie Endowment. And we're delighted to be co-hosting this event with uh, Minister Kimo Tilikainen, Finland's Minister for the Environment, Energy and Housing. So I think in a week that started with the Helsinki Summit, it's very appropriate to be discussing European energy security from a Finnish perspective here this morning. Um, I want to acknowledge Ambassador Kaupi. We're delighted that you can join us as well. So when it comes to European energy security, I think one issue that is very relevant from a Finnish perspective is, of course, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project. Earlier this year, Finnish authorities uh, gave permit for the pipeline to use Finland's economic zone, as did Sweden, whereas Denmark still has to make up uh, its mind. But beyond this issue, Finland also plays an active role in shaping the European debate in the European Union on the implementation of the energy union. And Finland has actively supported greater interconnectivity between the Nordic and the Baltic energy markets. But Finland also brings, I think, some unique perspectives to the conversation about energy security in Europe. As a frontline nation in the Arctic region, Finland has experienced firsthand the impact of climate change and environmental degradation. And I think currently um, the temperatures in northern Finland are sauna-like and there's forest fires raging, at least in neighboring Sweden. So it's clearly an issue that is facing the region. But Finland has taken significant steps in response. For example, Finland has embarked on an impressive strategy of energy transition from fossil fuels to renewables with the aim of becoming carbon neutral by 2045. Finland has also called attention to the negative impact of black carbon emissions in the Arctic region, which is a topic I understand that President Dinista spoke with President Trump about in Helsinki on Monday. So the minister will present Finland's perspective on European energy security, and will also discuss how to enhance transatlantic cooperation on this issue. This is a timely topic given the recent EU-US Energy Council meeting in Brussels a few weeks ago, and the potential for greater strategic level dialogue between the EU and the US on energy issues. The minister is uniquely placed to be discussing these topics, having served previously as the Minister of Agriculture um, and Minister of the Environment, member of the Finnish Parliament, but also someone who has a long-standing personal commitment to finding practical solutions to the challenges of global climate change. So the minister will provide some initial opening remarks. He will then be joined by my colleague David Livingston, who is the Deputy Director for Climate and Advanced Energy here at the Council's Global Energy Center for a one-on-one -on -one conversation and a Q&A. So with that, I invite the minister to join the stage and to kick us off. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to speak to you today. I thank Atlantic Council and Carnegie for arranging this in good cooperation with Finnish Embassy. So I was going to touch in my opening remarks or my short speech uh, this uh, European Union, energy union and energy security issues. Then I will more closely focus on what we are going to do in Finland in our energy policy in the future. And then, of course, I'm going to touch the climate perspective because uh, it's, uh, it has so close connection to the energy policy decisions that we are going to, going to make. <coughs> but actually, uh, before starting this, I'm going to give you a very current example referring to energy security. Just yesterday there was a fire near the nuclear plants in Finland. And during that fire the current transformer was um, handicapped and uh, at actually two-thirds of our nuclear capacity must be switched off of the grid very quickly. And you know that uh, nuclear is quite a remarkable share of our energy production. One third uh, of our electricity comes from nuclear sources and two thirds of this capacity was switched off in less than one day. What happened? Was there any blackout? Where 
Lights turned off? No. There were some short breaks in some distribution, uh, uh, the area of some distribution companies, but mostly the clients, customers didn't notice anything. Why? Because the electric security in Finland is uh, quite high level and we have very good transmission connection to the our neighboring countries, especially in Nordic countries. We have common electricity market within Nordic and Baltic countries. So one part of the energy security is that you have open, well-functioning market, you have enough transmission connection to your neighbors. And uh, that's how uh, I think we can make sure that uh, the energy supply will work even in that kind of uh, not uh, predictable incidents. Well, actually the repair work is going on right now and the expectation is that uh, both of these nuclear units that are disconnected will be connected within one day back to the grid and uh, the situation is over. Of course, electricity companies, they have a <coughs> reserve capacity for this kind of, and they were just uh, starting that, but uh, I, I'm, as a Minister of Energy, uh, I'm very glad that uh, this kind of incident can be handled so smoothly in Finnish uh, society. But dear, <coughs> dear audience, uh, what is European Union? What is European Union? When you talk about the European Union, ener energy union and uh, energy security, we have to keep in mind what's European Union and what it's made for. 28 member states has decided to remove barriers so that people, capital and products can freely move within this area. And by this means we have created functioning internal market for about 500 million persons. So this is the basic idea. Uh, create functioning internal market. And I think the same basic idea must be followed when we are thinking about the uh, energy union. Actually, currently, energy policy is uh, in hands of uh, single member states a lot, but we are uh, doing more and more cooperation uh, to create uh, this kind of uh, common target strategies and measures how to create better functioning energy union. EU wants to build this kind of union and the idea is fivefold. First, ensure energy security in Europe. Secondly, fully integrate the European energy market to benefit consumers. Third, improve energy efficiency. Four, pursue an ambitious climate policy. And finally, five, support research and innovation in energy transition. By this means, the EU will become less dependent on energy from outside its borders by making better, more efficient use of domestic energy sources. Diversifying energy sources and suppliers improves energy security further. There are several EU-level measures to secure supplies of gas, oil and electricity as well as collaboration with supplier countries and countries along supply roads. The EU has, for example, reinforced its um, security of supply laws, laws concerning security of supply. New regulation on electricity risk preparedness is under negotiation. The European Union is also aiming to build new transit roads to diversify its gas supplies. The Southern Gas Corridor aims to expand infrastructure that can bring gas to the EU from the Caspian Basin, Central Asia, the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean Basin. Also the LNG infrastructure in Europe is actively developed. A functioning competitive and diversified energy market is the best guarantee for energy security in Europe. It's also good to remember that all European Union member states are not similar. Every EU country has its own energy policy and own energy sources. Still, 
it's necessary to continue the development of the EU internal energy market also for increasing the share of renewable energy further. Therefore, the EU invests also in research and innovation. The uptake of new energy technologies is required for the energy transition and new technologies can contribute to the energy security by decreasing reliance on external suppliers of fossil fuels. <coughs> European Union and uh, United States must cooperate in energy issues. The eighth European Union US Energy Council was just met in Brussels a week ago. This was the first meeting of the Energy Council during the administration of President Trump. The meeting went well and the EU is looking forward to continue uh, cooperation with the US in energy sector. I think there are many topics in which the EU and the US have similar interests but also concerns. We all have to take care of modernization and resilience of energy infrastructure. Diversification of energy sources and infrastructure protection, for, for instance. <clears throat> that way it's more efficient for everybody to cooperate and try to find the best available solutions. I also believe that uh, we have great common interest to develop new kind of energy technologies that are more competitive and more effective than the previous one. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, both European Union, many of European Union countries and Nordic countries, Finland included, cooperates with the United States, for example, on the initiatives Clean Energy Ministerial and Mission Innovation, where the focus is to develop and innovate new kind of technologies to, uh, uh, to uh, cleaner energy supply in the future. Actually, Nordic countries hosted Clean Energy Ministerial meeting and Mission Innovation Ministerial uh, meeting just a little uh, more than one month ago in Copenhagen and Malmö. And uh, I think that uh, it was very encouraging uh, event because the reasons how we can transform our energy system to be more sustainable in the future, it's, it's remarkable potential for innovation in the future. So uh, I think that now it's time to say some more words uh, related to the, to the uh, Finnish energy policy. We keep in the center and front of Finnish energy policy to find and keep a balance between three important dimensions. The energy system must, number one, be cost effective and enable the growth of the national economy and competitiveness of Finnish companies in the global market. Secondly, the energy system must be sustainable from the perspective of greenhouse gas emissions and the environment widely. Thirdly, energy system must offer sufficient security of supply. And like the example I told you, I, I think that here we are in a good way forward. Important element of energy security for Finland is efficient and diversified uh, energy production. I guess there is some picture with you delivered to the benches, and uh, if you take um, the side share of fuels used in, sorry, total energy consumption by source uh, last year, it tells about the diversification of our energy uh, supply. The biggest part of our total energy consumption is uh, coming from biomass, renewable energy from biomass. Why on earth can biomass be so remarkable? Because of vast forest industries we have <coughs> in Finland. Uh, our biomass-based energy production that uh, is based on site products and site flows of uh, forest industries. 
So our principle is that we don't waste anything. Those part of the biomass that can't be translated into high-level products for the market can convert it to energy. And it's a huge amount of energy in total. Of course, in our total energy consumption, oil plays a big role because uh, it's used for traffic and transportation, like you know. Nuclear energy is important for electricity production, and we still have coal for heating and power production, natural gas much less. And for electricity production, also hydropower, wind power, and uh, functioning market, we're also importing some electricity, especially from our Nordic neighbors, they are important. But with this picture, it clearly tells that we have very diversified um, uh, energy system, and that's one part of the energy security. <coughs> Actually, in comparison to the average energy mix in the e EU, Finland has a much higher share of, share of domestic renewable energy and higher share of nuclear energy. Thus, the share of import in Finland's energy consumption is less than the European Union average. The EU has also given some support to projects that further increase Finland's energy security, such as Baltic Connector, the first gas pipeline connecting Finland and Estonia and other Baltic countries, and after a couple of years, we also connected via this new connection to the um, EU uh, gas market. Mm -hmm. Finnish government published a report on national energy and climate strategy a couple of years ago. We updated our climate and energy policy. In that strategy, we set a target that um, we will raise the share of renewable energy at least 50% by year 2030 from the total consumption, so including electricity, heating and uh, industrial needs and then uh, traffic and transportation. At the moment the share of renewables is about 40 from the total consumption and I guess it's I guess it's second highest in the European Union. <coughs> the growth in uh, supply of bioenergy and other emission free energy uh, will play an important role to reaching this target. <coughs> Increasing the share of renewable energy and further improving energy efficiency will ensure that Finland will fulfill the targets and goal goals as a European Union member state and at the same time increase our own energy security. Finland will hold the European Union Council presidency in the second half of um, next year and it will give us an important opportunity to contribute to the discussions on the future European Union energy and climate policy, as well as the implementation of the clean uh, energy uh, package. But <clears throat> I think that uh, the time is going forward and a very important part of our decisions referring to the energy policy, uh, they have a lot to do with our uh, principles in climate policy. So. I move to the climate part of the, uh, my speech and uh, Finland is very committed to fight against uh, climate change and global warming. We see that uh, it's an uh, essential target that we can keep the global warming below 2 degrees globally because in Arctic regions like uh, Finland uh, it will be double the raise in global temperature. If the global mean temperature raise is 2 degrees, it means 4 degrees in Finland. So that means that we will see remarkable changes in our nature, ecosystems and so on. And uh, the question is that the ecosystems are not ready to adapt that rapid changes that are taking place. And uh, for example, what kind of threat it will create for our uh, forest-based industries that is a huge cornerstone of our uh, economy if radical changes will take place in ecosystems. So uh, what to do? What to do? Of course we are willing to do our part but within European Union we are one of the countries that uh, 
is demanding that also European Union must implement what we have promised in international um, uh, podiums to do in uh, uh, climate uh, climate change policy. But then we are also pushing forward little more ambitious actions. And uh, like I mentioned that Finland is going to raise the share of renewables at least 50% by 2030. European Union made decisions concerning the European Union renewable targets just a couple of weeks ago. And the original proposal by Commission was that European Union will raise the share of renewables to 27%. But because of some active member states, Finland included, uh, we were pushing forward the target so that we decided that it will be 32%. Same take place in the decisions concerning energy efficiency. We went further than the uh, former uh, proposals. And by this means, we try to do things in climate policy faster, and we try to do more to keep the global temperature below the two degree target. <clears throat> so, I would uh, still name a few very concrete decisions we have made in our climate and energy policy. We have decided to phase out coal in our energy production palette by year 2029. The legislation is prepared. I will give it to the Finnish Parliament in autumn, and uh, then it will be in part of our legislation that the latest day that you can use coal in energy production is 2029. And besides of that, we are, have some incentives for those energy producers that are able to give up use of coal by 2025. At the moment, it's uh, around 10% the share of coal in our energy production. And it, it's mainly used in the biggest cities to produce regional heating and electricity in combined heat and power plants. And uh, I'm very glad uh, to know this, that some of these cities has already indicated that they are willing to work uh, for the um, quicker timetable so that they are ready to give up coal by 2025. <coughs> Another remarkable decision is that we are going to cut by half the use of fossil oil by 2030. Like you remember this, the share of oil is huge. And these decisions uh, must be implemented mainly in transportation and traffic sector. Of course, we are expecting that electric vehicles will take place sooner or later uh, in the coming decades. But to quickly reduce our dependency on fossil uh, imported oil, we are going to raise the share of renewable component in all fuel sold up to 30% by year 2030. Actually, even at, uh, even at the moment, uh, when we were implementing the previous European Union uh, climate and energy decisions by 2020, we doubled the European Union target with renewable fuels. And what happened when we decided this 10 years ago. There are several leading, worldwide leading companies who are producing advanced third generation bio, uh, renewable diesel and biofuels in Finland. So it gave boost to develop new kind of technologies and that's why we are um, very reliable that this 30% share of renewables in all fuels sold is uh, not at all difficult uh, to fulfill. Actually, for example, one company, Neste, who is a uh, forerunner in this sector, it has production in not only in Finland, it has production in Netherlands, it has production plant in Singapore, and actually it's uh, selling a lot of renewable diesel to the United States as well. So um, we want to be forerunner in this uh, part of development in future. So 
I guess these were the things that I would like to introduce you from European Union energy policy, Finnish energy policy, and the climate perspective. And uh, I think it's time to conclude somehow this, <laughs> this, so that we can go forward. So we would like to reduce our dependence on imported fossil fuels. How we are going to do that? We are going to do that by improving energy efficiency and developing a lot renewable energy sources that are available in our own, own country. So that's our way how we are going to improve the energy security in Finland. And uh, we have this European Union wide well-functioning single market and uh, by developing it in energy sector we can make better functioning energy union and improve the energy sector uh, security throughout Europe. What works in Finland works European Union wide and that's why we are focusing so much to develop uh, renewables that can be produced within European Union to reduce the dependence on imported fossil fuels. Thank you so much for arranging this event. Minister Tillikainen, thank you very much for, for joining us at the Atlanta Council today. Thank you for those, for those remarks. Very refreshing. Um, my name is David Livingston. I'm the Deputy Director for Climate and Advanced Energy here at the Atlanta Council uh, in our Global Energy Center. Uh, and I have to say, we, we, as you know very well, I'm sure the, the Atlanta Council has a rich DNA and a rich heritage in discussing energy security in Europe. Uh, but it's rare to actually hear such enlightened remarks in terms of understanding fully the balance between harvesting what is unique about uh, Finland, its resource space, its energy policy mm -hmm. infrastructure or architecture, um, but also balancing that with the recognition of the strengths of, of the, the EU's energy policy, the Energy Union Project, the third energy energy package, the, the new set of uh, laws and legal protections that you have that ensure a free flow of energy within the European Union. So thank you very much for those thank remarks. Um, I, I wanted to, to touch upon uh, some of the, the, uh, the aspects of your remarks that that addressed EU-US cooperation. As you noted, it, it was uh, uh, perhaps overshadowed by other events going on in Helsinki, uh, but, but there was uh, a, a very notable first uh, iteration of the EU-US Energy Council. I yeah. think it's eighth iteration, but it's first iteration under the Trump administration um, that recently took place. You teased out a little bit some of the areas uh, where you'd like to see more US-EU, or at least continued US-EU cooperation on energy policy, including I think uh, you, you particularly underscored the, the role of innovation and working mm -hmm. on next generation technologies, be they advanced solar, nuclear, carbon capture, energy efficiency, yeah. digital energy, whatever it might be. Could you expand a little bit more on um, areas that you see for cooperation within the EU-US Energy Council, and as well as um, areas for cooperation uh, perhaps on a subnational level. As you know, many of the things that you're doing in Finland with bioenergy are somewhat similar to the uh, advanced fuels policies being pushed in jurisdictions like California. So I'd love to hear as well your vision of w either what's going on already or what could be done in the future for greater engagement between the EU, the US government, the EU, and various different US states and subnational uh, actors. Well, first of all, I need to say that uh, it was a uh, very good thing that we had this um, EU-US uh, Energy Council uh, meeting and uh, Ministers Perry and Pompeo were there to meet their European colleagues. And uh, the most important outcome is that both sides realized that we need this <laughs> conversation and we need this discussion and uh, it's definitely worth continuing this uh, work of this council. 
Um, yeah, that's true that I mentioned especially this innovation and development of new, uh, new advanced technologies to, uh, to produce even cleaner or more profitable energy in the future. And I think that's something that we both have a great capacity of innovations. Both United States, both European Union, in our universities and research institutes. So I think it's very natural that if we combine these efforts and power, it gives a lot of boost for the development in energy sector. But of course, this uh, energy security perspective is uh, very important to touch in these discussions. And it's uh, important to see that we are on the same side. <laughs> we are on the same side, European Union and United States, in this issue as well. <laughs> um, speaking of EU energy security and, and being on the same side uh, across the Atlantic, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on the, the inevitable elephant in the room. Uh, it's hard to have a, an event on energy security in Europe here in Washington without having questions raised about Nord Stream 2. So I'll go ahead and preempt them. Um, I, I'll note that on President Trump's trip to Europe, uh, it, it's already been, been well, well noted in the press, but the, the tone he struck towards the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project uh, at the NATO summit was quite different than the tone uh, that he struck in Helsinki, speaking at the press conference after the summit. Um, you were obviously you were the hosting government of, of that summit. You provided the forum for it. Um, you, you've surely kept a close eye on these discussions, both in the EU but as well as the U.S. position on Nord Stream Two. What does Finland make of this? Uh, what's Finland's view of what's ultimately going to end up happening? And and do you do you foresee the the U.S. actually exercising any of those um, uh, kind of reserved sanctions uh, uh, options that that are provided through the CATSA legislation in the Congress? Or, or do you think that uh, in a year's time or a two years time, uh, this might just be a, a much quieter conversation and we will have moved on? Well, first I need to say that, uh, of course, uh, it was an honor for Helsinki and Finland to arrange this uh, Helsinki summit that took place on Monday. And while your President uh, Trump was traveling to Finland, I was flying to US, <laughs> to New York, to take part in the United Nations meeting. So. Uh, I was following the <laughs> meeting <laughs> from here from the same perspective than <laughs> you did. Uh, but uh, <coughs> this Nord Stream uh, 2, um, so uh, in the Finnish perspective, it's a purely commercial project. And uh, we have um, thought that uh, we have to respect uh, international rule of law with the project like this and uh, um, the pipeline not a single cubic meter, meter is coming to the Finnish market it, it's passing Finland in the uh, sea area and uh, according this uh, uh, this uh, United Nations Convention of uh, Law of the Seas uh, we have treated it uh, with these principles and did the um, licensing processes uh, purely commercial and environmental base without uh, uh, touching any politics to this uh, issue. And um, I think that uh, if I think it, uh, if I see it from the other end of the pipe, from the middle Europe, uh, I, for example, in the uh, Netherlands and in the Northern Sea, um, the gas fields there are going down. They need new sources of uh, uh, gas and uh, it's just one connection. Like I mentioned in my speech, European Union is going to build uh, a lot of connection to different uh, uh, corners uh, to ensure the supply of gas. And then uh, we are also improving our energy capacity. It's uh, just one source of gas to well-functioning market. 
Absolutely. Um, one of the other projects you noted in your remarks, the Baltic Connector project, yeah. uh, is intended to access additional sources of gas. It doesn't get as much attention as Nord Stream 2 in this town, but it's another important project. Um, uh, could you give us a little bit of an update just on the, the timeline for the Baltic Connector mm -hmm. project, as well as um, what, having, uh, what, what that means in terms of having new access to underground gas storage in the Baltic region, having additional access to perhaps LNG imports at the Klaipeda terminal mm -hmm. uh, that, that uh, the Finnish gas market would then be able to access. Yeah. Do, will it change the use of gas in Finland or not? Actually, it's a uh, much more interesting uh, gas project from Finnish perspective than Nord Stream 2 because this Baltic connector is connecting Finland and Estonia. And uh, uh, the building has started and it will be ready before year 2020. And it has made it possible to renew our gas market legislation. So we are opening the gas market uh, uh, to full competition in the beginning of year 2020. Now when we will have uh, several sources of gas, then there is a basement for the functioning market available. And it's very important that the gas can uh, flow to <laughs> both direction. It's uh, very important in throughout the Europe that the, uh, the gas can flow from one place to another and from second place to the first one uh, according to the uh, market and uh, consumption. Um, and uh, of course when this uh, Lithuanian LNG uh, harbor is uh, ready and we have also connection from Baltic countries to the Central Europe. It will improve the uh, markets in Baltic and Finland gas uh, remarkably. And we are expecting that. Uh, what's the result of that? You know, there was this picture I showed you here. <laughs> uh, the share of natural gas is 5% of our total energy consumption. So when we are facing out coal, I guess that uh, in next few years there will be some uh, growth in consumption of natural gas, but uh, in long term I don't see that uh, even this Baltic connector, it's not increasing uh, the share of gas in our um, energy portfolio. Uh, anyway, it's much more environmental friendly than coal for example, but anyway it's uh, one fossil energy form and we are investing more to renewables. But it's very important in the transformation to uh, renewable driven energy system. Thank you. Um, I, I've probably spoken enough here and, and in any case we, we've certainly had uh, probably enough uh, white males on this stage already today. <laughs> so let me open things up for questions um, and, uh, and get a, a broader diverse set of questions from the audience here. Yes, there's one at the back. Thank you, Melissa Hirsch, uh, risk consultant in ASU. Uh, given Finland's commitment to energy and electricity integration with the Baltics, your commitment to nuclear energy and waste management, your view that Nord Stream 2 is purely commercial, and your commitment to the 2029 coal targets, what does the minister think about Ukraine's energy bridge proposal to integrate nuclear-powered electricity with, e with the EU via Poland? Kitos. Mm. So it's very important that uh, we have the good cooperation between European Union and Ukraine and it's important to keep the uh, gas transport uh, gas pipeline working that uh, goes through Ukraine and uh, they must be also improved in the future. So I don't see that uh, uh, we, we I would say that we very highly welcome efforts of the European Commission to secure that Ukraine will remain an important gas transit country in the future as well. So that's our uh, policy. And, and maybe a follow-up question? Yeah. Well, the question wasn't about the gas transit through Ukraine. The question was about the concept, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, about the energy bridge, which is taking um, electricity that's generated from nuclear power plants in Ukraine and transmitting that 
to Poland, so it can enter sorry, into sorry, sorry. the EU electricity market. Yeah. It's, uh, it might be a little more uh, complicated issue. I was telling that uh, when we are creating European Union uh, electricity market, well-functioning market and uh, secure market means that we must have connections within European Union, but also outside the European Union. And uh, for example, this is not the only direction that may uh, bring electricity to European Union. There are also plans to uh, have uh, transmission lines in the future, for example, from Northern Africa to the Southern Europe, based on uh, solar power, huge solar power areas. So we need uh, energy transition connection, I guess, to uh, each direction. I, th I think uh, energy is uh, its market issue. Do you have additional questions? There's one here. Hi, yes, I'm Bill Freeburn with Platts. Um, I have a question. You started talking about a nuclear uh, plant that shut down, but you didn't talk much about the new nuclear plants. Uh, Finland is one of the old two, only two countries in Europe building two nuclear plants right now. And I was wondering if you could give us a little update on the status of those. One is almost basically complete, ready to come online. And uh, if you could talk about how nuclear power fits into the, the, the Finnish energy mix. Like I mentioned, uh, one third of our electricity is produced uh, with uh, by, by nuclear power at the moment, and there are one new nuclear power plant that is uh, in the test test phase, and uh, I guess that next year it will be uh, connected to the Finnish grid, and the total amount of electricity it will produce is uh, less than uh, we are importing at the moment. So uh, it will be for, uh, for need. And anyway, uh, I spoke a lot about the renewables, but in electricity, also nuclear is uh, CO2 free. And uh, those investments are long lasting and uh, I guess um, once the uh, principal permission is given to the new nuclear power plants, then it's more safety issue that all the high safety standards are fulfilled when you are building. But uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we won't see, uh, I would say never, <laughs> wouldn't say never, but uh, it will take a long time before we see even discussion about the possible further um, application for uh, licenses for new nuclear powers. And the uh, second one uh, that has this principal license, it hasn't even applied the license, uh, building license yet. So it's in the very uh, beginning state. To, to clarify when you say that, are you speaking about kind of existing nuclear technologies that are being built today or are you also saying that you're um, skeptical about for the outlook of advanced nuclear technologies, um, small modular reactors and the like? Well, uh, what I just said, uh, it referred more to the current technologies and the huge plants. Of course I'm following with great interest the development of uh, I would say small scale uh, nuclear, but anyway, um, I think uh, it's uh, it will take some time before we can see them in in practice in functioning. Okay. Let's see. Yes, it's one interesting uh, path of new kind of energy technology development. Certainly. One question over here. Well, thank you. I'm Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. It's my understanding that with the uh, building of a pipeline, there's a tremendous uh, capital investment at the beginning uh, to get it going. And then over decades, uh, you plan to uh, u use the pipeline and, and the investors are hoping to uh, recoup their investment. 
So given uh, the, the uh, rapid pace of uh, technological change and so forth and so on, that we're not even quite sure what might be the situation with energy use in a decade, uh, what, how, how do you see the tremendous risks that these investors are putting in, into pipelines that they expect they're going to be uh, uh, getting uh, their money back over uh, 40 years or something? That's a very good question, and I think that uh, it's almost the same in any form of energy, that uh, investments are very long-lasting. With nuclear, they are 60 or 80 years, and uh, gas pipelines, you said 40 years, yeah. Wind power, 20 or 30 years, and so on and so on. So energy sector needs remarkable investments, no matter what source of energy we are going to use. And uh, it's just the typical character of the energy market that it is so, it's so capital intensive. Uh, I don't know, I was uh, speaking a lot about, the, and we were discussing about the new uh, energy technology and solutions, uh, the better ones. Actually, that's uh, one very good point of view that we should have that kind of energy technologies that are not that capital intensive. Mm -hmm. Please tell me what are they. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question right here, yes. Uh, Mike Masetic, PBS Online News Hour. First of all, I can't help but observe that the Atlantic Council must be grateful that our president has admitted Finland to NATO. Uh, but uh, uh, you you have you wear two hats your energy and environment yeah. but when you go into these meetings with the united states where they separate the two uh portfolios and particularly on coal because you're getting rid of coal you said the united states at the moment anyway is promoting coal how much uh from a climate standpoint do you get into that in these uh meetings with the eu u.s energy council Very good question. So, uh, at the moment we have a little bit different directions <laughs> in European Union and US, referring to the uh, coal issue. And uh, actually, it's not only Finland that is going to phase out coal in energy production. We were one of the countries uh, establishing the Powering Past Coal Alliance mm. in last climate negotiations in Bonn uh, together with uh, several other uh, countries. So why Finland is moving forward in phasing out coal and why we are putting that in legislation? First, uh, I think that in the climate perspective it's clear that in future we have to reduce use of all fossil energy sources because they are the source of CO2 emissions we need to reduce. And countries like Finland, if we have means and if we have technology and if we have will that we can show that it's possible in practice to get rid of coal. That's, uh, I would say, it's our responsibility to do that, together with some other countries who can do that. And if cold country, cold country like Finland can get rid of coal, I think it's much easier for countries that are in southern latitudes and where the sun is shining throughout the year. Let's talk about your, your latitude again in a different context, the Arctic Council. Yeah. Finland is halfway through its <coughs> chairmanship of the Arctic yeah. Council. I know that the Arctic came up in the, uh, in the breakfast meeting between President Trump and President Ninisto. Um, I believe that, uh, that, that President Ninisto brought up the black carbon issue. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about why black carbon is so important uh, in the Arctic region and for Finland's Arctic policy? Uh, and do you envision that there was progress made? Do you see that there might be future meetings on this, that it uh, might come to the forefront within the Arctic Council uh, under this chairmanship? and, and uh, under future chairmanships as well. So uh, black carbon is air pollutant, uh, remarkable air pollutant that cause global warming and it's uh, not that long lasting that CO2 that also means that if we can reduce uh, black carbon emissions we can uh, quite quickly have positive effects uh, following our measures. Uh, black carbon, uh, it melts snow and ice when it's grounded. 
And uh, it's very easy to understand that uh, reducing these emissions, we can reduce the melting of ice and uh, slow down the changes in Arctic regions. And eight countries around the uh, Arctic uh, area, it's uh, up in our hands. We do it for our own sake, to save our own Arctic areas and Arctic nature. Lapland in Finland and Scandinavia, Alaska and US and Canada and northern parts of Russia, they are all uh, hit by the uh, very quick warming if we don't do anything. And this is something that we can do ourselves. It's something that we can decide under the Arctic Council. And actually, we have made decisions to reduce black carbon emissions. And we are working forward with this issue. And that's very true that President Niinistö raised this issue with his discussions with President Trump and with President Putin. And uh, uh, he has done that it wasn't the first time. So uh, hopefully, during our Arctic Council presidency, we can see some concrete steps forward in this, for example, in this black carbon issue. Good. Do we have any further questions out there? Yes, one question up front here. Hi, uh, Deborah Kagan. Um, I just wanted to follow up on one thing you mentioned, Minister, on the um, when you're phasing out coal, you said there might be some small increase in consumption of gas. Do you know what that percentage might be and and how long you expect that percentage to stay static until you transition to another renewable? So that's an uh, excellent question. And actually, I wish that before the energy companies are closing down the coal power plants, they have chances to switch to gas even before closing the gas, because uh, coal, sorry, uh, because it's used in regional heating, in combined heat and power production, and they have also capacity to use more gas instead of coal at the moment. So uh, I wish that, uh, and I think that when they are closing down the coal power plants, they are taking full advantage of the gas capacity. And that means that, uh, I can't say the exact percentage, but uh, if our current gas consum consumption is uh, around 5% and coal around 10 perhaps uh, uh, I would say a couple of percent, uh, percentage will change from coal to gas. But the most of the re uh, replacing energy, I guess, will become from uh, biomass and also geothermal and some kind of uh, uh, we are going to make u better use of the waste heat from uh, uh, different industries. It's very wise way <laughs> to produce heat for consumers to make use of the waste heat that someone else is already producing that is otherwise going just for waste. <laughs> So uh, just a couple of percent, it's uh, more, I'm, that's my uh, guess. And just one final question connected to this. You've called for an expansion of the EU emission trading system, uh, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, <coughs> to, to have more sectoral coverage and to have broader coverage of just all ener energy use across the EU than it currently does. Mm -hmm. um, have you, do you feel like you're receiving traction on that idea? Uh, are you, is there opposition within the EU to that idea? And is that necessary to achieve the emission reductions and the energy transition uh, uh, benchmarks that, that you would like to achieve? Um, thank you for that question. <laughs> Is this first question that I thank you? <laughs> 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 Sorry. Uh, emission trade system, ETS, it's market-based and the most cost-effective way to allocate the emission reductions. So the idea is that when we are um, limiting the allowances of CO2 and lowering them, we need this kind of market-based tool to make it uh, the best possible, the cheapest possible way, cost-effective way. At the moment, emission trade uh, is covering 
industries and energy production. And it's about 40% of the European Union total emissions. So the idea of Finland is that if we have very efficient tool, market-based tool to uh, implement emission reductions, why should we only use it for the minority of emissions? It should be broadened to cover bigger share of emissions. And our proposal is that emission trade system could be enlarged to cover all, all emissions from heating. <coughs> and um, then the coverage will be more than, <coughs> excuse me, more than 50% of the all emissions in European Union. So this is a very new proposal. And uh, I think that uh, it will take several years before we are really um, revising the emission trade. But I wish that this will be under fully consideration within Member States and Commission when we are making the ne next revision of emission trade system in Europe. Now we have uh, made decisions that uh, will last to 2030, but I'm pretty sure that we must fix it before that year because there is need to do climate policy that is more effective, do it faster and do more. And one part of that is changes in emission trade. Excellent. Well, we'll keep our eyes on that. Um, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm, I'm smart enough to know that when I'm thanked for a question, I should quit while I'm ahead. So <laughs> I, I also know you have a busy schedule here in Washington, so we want to allow you to get on with your day. But, uh, but I'd, I'd ask everyone in the audience here to uh, thank you again for, for, for coming this morning, for joining us for this important conversation. And please join me in thanking uh, Minister Tili Kainen for, for joining us here at the Atlantic Council today. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.